My name is Dr. Matthew Long, and uh, my personal pronouns are he, him, and his. I'd like to welcome you to We the Future Social Justice Conference. I have the privilege of serving as the Dean of Student Services on this beautiful and vibrant campus uh, called SRJC Petaluma. And I have the pleasure of officially welcoming you here today for the second annual We the Future Social Justice Conference. I'd like to acknowledge um, a couple of Board of Trustees members that we have with us today, Maggie Fishman, Dorothy Battenfeld. Thank you so much for being with us today. On behalf of the administration here, we'd like to welcome you. Uh, in, in 2016, several faculty and staff members of SRJC, myself included, um, had a transformative experience that affected us both personally and professionally. As a part of that national conference on race and ethnicity called INCOR, if you've ever been to that conference, uh, we challenged ourselves to grapple with the complex and emotional issues of social justice, uh, way beyond the issues of race and ethnicity that confront our society and ourselves. And out of that experience, we walked away with a clear urgency that the same conversations needed to take place in our own community. And out of that urgency, this conference was born. And every year, this conference fo fo focuses on a social justice theme that represents an immediate issue in our community. And that's why our uh, theme this year deals with issues of food justice, represented in our title, Feeding Ourselves, Feeding Our Souls. Our keynote speaker will, I think, bring a clear picture of the food issues confronting our communities, um, locally, regionally, nationally. Uh, but even locally, I can tell you that questionable food security represents a critical issue plaguing the students at this college. Uh, every week, both campuses of the junior college give away literally tons of fresh food and uh, vegetables from the Redwood Empire Food Bank to students and community members that have very few other resources. Food and basic need pantries at community colleges, including SRJC, are now the new normal. And that's not a good new normal. My hope is that today we will grapple with this and many other issues that confront us as we uh, work to live in a society that moves beyond survival to one that is more caring, to one that is more just. Welcome to We The Future Conference, and now I'd like to introduce our coordinator for the conference, Dr. Amanda Morrison, and also our coordinator of Our House Intercultural Center. Amanda? Well, that was nice. Thank you. It's, it's wonderful to see you all. I just wanted to go over a couple of logistical things. Uh, first, that everyone, you know, hopefully you all have a program. The way it's, it's uh, rolling out is, by noon, we'll go eat, break bread together, right? That's important. Um, the, the dining commons area is where you um, get your free lunch. And, um, and also live music by SLV, Sandra Lilia Velasquez, which is gonna be dope. Um, and then the last time, ch the chunk of time, 1.30 to 2.45, is the other set of sessions where you again choose which one you would like to attend. Um, I want to also acknowledge Sponsors, this is definitely a community effort, and a lot of people stepped up from the campus community and beyond to help make this happen. Um, that includes our, our whole student government um, team, so uh, student government association, as well as Petaluma Council of Student Leaders. And huge, let's give a huge shout out to North Bay Organizing Project, who's been our co-host <laughs> both years. as well as um, Sonoma Family Meal, with an organization founded after the fires to feed our community members. Let's give them a hand, too. <laughs> and also our own SRJC Office of Student Equity, which underwrites a lot of these amazing kind of community building um, uh, events, and SRJC Foundation, who uh, granted, granted the conference a uh, Randolph Newman Cultural Enrichment Endowment Grant. Um, thank you. So just briefly, um, before Nikki Silvestri comes on, I also want to introduce Anesti Vega. He is a, a, a youth leadership activist, speaks to a lot of issues around the indigenous rights and sovereignty, who's going to say a few words about this land that we stand on since, I mean, we're, we're thinking a lot today about food and nurturance and the earth. So Anesti, come on.
Kise Oreshe. My name is Anesti Vega. I am from the member of the Tupi Namba tribe. Uh, today, here in Petaluma, we are on Coast Miwok and Pomo lands. That's important to acknowledge because uh, some of you may not know the first governor of California when California was formed uh, as a state within the Union called for the extermination and genocide of California indigenous people and would reimburse uh, rogue agents to go out uh, and assassinate indigenous people and reimburse them for their guns and their bullets. Uh, millions of dollars was spent in that time period reimbursing people for the, this genocide that happened in California. So it's important to acknowledge that. A lot of you work in social justice um, and whatever issues uh, or issue you focus on, whether it be uh, food justice or gender, uh, equal rights, uh, whatever it may be, uh, I firmly urge you to have it start with indigenous sovereignty and acknowledgement and recognition of the land you're doing that work on. It needs to start with indigenous sovereignty. Here locally, there's great resources to reach out to. I urge you to connect uh, your work to the indigenous leadership that's in the area. There's the Great Rancheria Tribal Council Office that I urge you to reach out to. And then in Santa Rosa, there's also the California Indian Museum. Uh, Nikki Lim is the executive director there. There's lots of workshops on providing uh, history around uh, California's Indian people. And so, uh, Again, I urge you to, to combine your work, to, to lay the foundation of your work with indigenous sovereignty so that collectively we can work on decolonizing ourselves and our communities and the work that we do. Thank you. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Nikki Silvestri. Um, she has an amazing background, served as ex executive director formerly of two um, um, heavy hitting organizations doing social justice and sustainability work, um, People's Grocery in Oakland, as well as Green for All, the national organization um, connected to Van Jones's work and a lot of other um, uh, nationally known uh, activists. Um, she a claim to fame that I, I, I noticed right off. The Root Magazine, which I love, the online magazine covering African American issues, named her one of the 100 most influential African Americans. Um, and she's appeared on TV, on Huffington, uh, written for Huffington Post, um, uh, um, Melissa Harris Perry show on NBC, Chris Harry's show. Um, so she's definitely a, a really special emerging uh, voice and thought leader uh, in areas of food justice, sustainability, racial justice, and equity. So please um, give a round of applause for Nikki Silvestri. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Yay. Okay, so the new mom in me. Is my baby? I can hear him. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, where's my child? I hear the screams. He's like, Mama's on stage. <laughs> so thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a real honor to be talking about this topic because food justice is something that's so specific. A lot of times people don't know what I'm talking about when I say those two words together. So to be able to speak with an audience that not only knows what it is, but cares about it is a privilege. And I wanted to go on a journey with you today about my food justice story so that you could get to know me a little bit better and get to know the bigger circumstances that we're living in when it comes to food systems and justice. The core of my work is building strong communities. It's taken me a while to really land on that one sentence when people say, what, it is, what is it that you do? I've done a lot of different stuff, but at the core of it, I build community. And the first step to building community is relationship. So I wanted to start with my early, early days. What's my food story? My mom went on a diet when she was trying to get pregnant with me and put my dad on a diet when they were trying to get pregnant with me so that he would be virile and he would have the strongest sperm to create this human right here. 
That is how serious my mom took food and food justice. And then she stayed on that super healthy diet when she was pregnant with me, she stayed on that diet when she was breastfeeding, and then she had my brothers and was on that diet for so long, it basically became the way she ate. And why was she on that diet? She was on that diet because I don't have any great aunts and great uncles that didn't die with some limb or toe or something amputated because of diabetes. And that was how I got to know diabetes. I had no idea it was about sugar or insulin when I was a kid because it's always like, well, why are Poppy's feet wrapped? Because he has diabetes. Why is Aunt Mildred in a wheelchair? She was a triple amputee by the time she died. Why is that? Diabetes. So my mom was real serious about it. Both my parents were. Do you remember the raisin brand with the little sugar crystals on the raisins? I thought that was candy because they were that serious about not letting us have sugar. Now, I'm, I kind of get on my knees and thank the Lord that they did that because it completely shaped, I think, the way that I developed. And then to become an adult and find out something like African Americans get diabetes 1.7 times more than white Americans, it's like, oh, okay, that's clear. And then to circle it back around in terms of that story, when I got pregnant last year, I did my gestational diabetes test at 28 weeks, assuming I did not have it because I eat. I'm a, when I say I'm a foodie, I'm real serious about it. And we're going to get into that a little bit later in this talk. But I mean real serious about what I put into my body. Didn't matter. I definitely had gestational diabetes. And I ended up having to eat paleo because my midwife was very clear that I needed to cut out all carbs. My numbers were terrible. My little boy was at risk. And it doesn't go away sometimes. Sometimes it goes away a few days after you give birth. Sometimes it sticks. So I'm pre-diabetic. And it doesn't matter that I eat really well now. It doesn't matter that I changed my eating habits in my 20s. It's a social determinant of health, which is something that we're going to get into a little bit later. But now I'm on a special diet for my little boy so that as I'm breastfeeding him, he has the best possible start. And I still know that there's some things that are in his genes and in his blood that he's always gonna have to watch out for. So really at its core, when it comes to that personal food story and relationship and where we start, it's so important to understand that the way our bodies form when we're younger and the history of our cultures and our food stories and what's in our DNA really impacts us. That's why systemic change is so important, because individual behavior change sometimes isn't enough to make sure that we aren't predisposed to certain things. Individual behavior change just makes sure that we actually stay healthy enough to have a high quality of life. So how did I get into all of this? That's my personal story. But what's my professional story? I got into food really through sustainability I, and climate change. When I was in college, an inconvenient truth came out. And before that, I wanted to teach black theater, just so you can get a sense of how different my career path was going to be. And then I saw An Inconvenient Truth, and I was like, oh, we're going to die. <laughs> just straight up. I guess I can't do theater if we don't have air to breathe. So I became one of those super agitated college activists walking around talking about how we're going to die. And then I realized that's not probably the best way to get people inspired to create change. <laughs> So I shifted from my devastating, depressing climate activism to what's going to actually inspire people to make change? Food. Food was always something that was a passion of mine. I mean, because I like to eat real good food, my husband will tell you. And I think also Harvard did this one study. They spent a few million dollars trying to figure out how people come up with the best ideas after all that work get them around a dinner table, feed them really good food. The best ideas come out of that, according to Harvard. So it's true. <laughs> but I, I got into food systems through, kind of through a windy road as well, where when Michelle Obama planted the White House garden in 2009, I realized that it was time. 
to shift from climate change and get into food systems. But I was really interested in the local story. And that's what I'll tell a little bit about my time at People's Grocery because it was a very, very beautiful time in my career and we did really beautiful work. So the problem, West Oakland at the time, 30,000 people, 50 something liquor stores, no full service grocery stores. And the issue with no full service grocery stores just to be clear, I mean, now there's Mandela Foods Co-op, which is incredible, and People's Community Market, actually the offshoot of People's Grocery, is going to be opening there soon. But when it comes to a community of 30,000 people, there's an ecosystem of how those people get their food, an economic ecosystem, usually a full-service grocery store. And the difference between full-service and not full-service is that there are grocery stores that have all of the offerings, bread, cheese, meat, et cetera, but they just they don't have counters. They have containers where you can get it yourself. Full service means that there's someone at the meat counter, there's someone at the cheese counter, there's someone at the pastry and the bread counter, so that if you need something specialized, you can get it. That's a full service grocery store. And that's usually an anchor in a community of that amount of people so that other smaller specialty markets can pop up around it. But those markets, the specialty markets, don't have to carry the entire burden of getting everybody their basic food needs. That means millions of dollars was leaving West Oakland all the time to go outside of the community and not benefit that community. And when it comes to economic justice, that's where the food justice and the economic justice messages link. That if you're spending five to six million dollars outside of the community, because you don't have a full service grocery store, the multiplier effect of spending your dollar in your local community doesn't happen. And when I say multiplier effect, that means when you spend your dollar locally versus spending your dollar at a place that just sends that dollar somewhere off internationally, it recirculates a few different times inside your community, building up your community's economic resiliency. So, all of that, no full service grocery store, People's Grocery, the not-for-profit, was developed to try to experiment with different economic generators around food to not only feed people, but to also show what the potential was for economic development around food systems in West Oakland. So on the economic development side, we had a produce box, and now everybody knows what a community-supported, what community-supported agriculture? Do we know what this is? So for anybody who doesn't, the original idea of community-supported agriculture was that farmers, when they farm, are completely subject to the whims of nature. You can invest all of your capital, and you have to invest all of your capital on the front end. You need your equipment, you need your seeds, you need all of that, and then hopefully you'll recoup all of that at the end of your growing season when you harvest and you sell your produce. But what happens if there's a freeze in the middle of the season and you lose your entire crop and you've already spent all your money? That's why community-supported agriculture was developed, to solve that problem, so that individuals who wanted to commit to buying a season's worth of something would, in the beginning of that season, pay the farmer so that they didn't have to spend their own capital, and that if there was a freeze or there was a crop loss in the middle of the season, both the consumer and the producer would share the risk, share the burden, share the profits. So that was the original community-supported agriculture, and it has since morphed into all of these beautiful different offshoots of produce boxes. We were one of the offshoots because at, I think the peak, we had a couple hundred people getting our produce box, and we for sure weren't growing enough food to serve 200 people. We would grow some things in our garden and have specialty items that came from West Oakland, but we would bring in bulk food suppliers to serve the rest of that. The really innovative thing about our, it was called the grub box. Well, the really innovative thing about the grub box was that it was a tiered pricing model. We were one of the first community supported agriculture programs that was able to take food stamps. And we had to go through a lot of rigmarole to make that happen. The cost of the box was $18. Those who could afford it paid $24. And those who couldn't afford it paid $12. And there was a split, a subsidy. The business training that I have now, those numbers would have been different. I would have been done, been charged $30 for that box, but that's a whole other story. Um, we, and what's most important about that is we had a very sophisticated way when it comes to food justice of understanding who qualified for the $12 box. If there was someone in the community 
who was choicefully living a simple life, who had support systems around them in terms of safety nets, then that was considered a choice. And we would engage them in a back and forth conversation about whether or not they actually needed the $12 box, as opposed to a family that has no support systems whatsoever because the father's in prison, one of the sons has been killed by the cops, and a few of the other siblings are barely just trying to graduate high school. Even if the income is the same, the social circumstances may look different. But we never, never, never argued with someone when they gave us their answer because we understood that it's complex. If you think you need it, then you think you need it. But we will absolutely try to have the conversation with you. Another hilarious intersection between food justice and food education was the corn. This is a story I love to tell. So you have store-bought organic corn and you have farmed organic corn. Store-bought organic corn, most of the time, check it out in the grocery store next time it's in season, usually has the tops chopped off. Do you know why? I heard it, the worms. So worms are hella smart. They do not like nasty ass GMO corn. So they will not be on GMO corn. They're gonna be on the delicious organic corn. And it's very difficult to prevent them if you don't wanna do crazy herbicide and pesticide type stuff. So we would get the full stalks of the organic corn and we were used to chopping off the tops ourselves, but then we started getting a lot of phone calls from people. There's worms in my corn! Ugh, this is nasty, the corn is bad. We were on the phone a lot those couple weeks trying to inform, and then we realized we probably should have had a note about that in the box beforehand, but it just helped us understand that like when we were talking people off the ledge of throwing out six ears of really good quality corn, cut the worms off. It's okay. It's the exact same thing the grocery store does except you're doing it yourself, so you know it's fresh and not days old. It's okay. But that was a huge thing with food justice for us, was food education and food literacy. Where does our food come from? Do you know what it looks like when it's fresh? Do you know how insects act when it's fresh? This is actually a complete digression, but I was in a farm to table restaurant once in New York, had a delicious salad, and then one of the leaves started moving and I realized that it was like a, um, it was a huge mantis type thing, covered in salad dressing, started walking off the plate, <laughs> running for its life, limping because I think that I'd already eaten one of its legs. And I was like, dude, you are a fighter. I picked it up, I put it in a napkin, we walked outside, I rinsed it off a little bit of water, go forth. You survived the harvesting, you survived the salad dressing and the tossing and the mixing and behind the scenes and all that. You are powerful and I support your power. <laughs> so that's what we want when it comes to food literacy. Um, the other things quickly that I'll say about People's Grocery that we loved was we had a demonstration garden. And the meaning of a demonstration garden is that it was too small, it was a quarter of an acre, so it wasn't very big. It was too small to grow a, a large quantity of food, but we wanted a demonstration garden to show what was possible in the city. And it was behind a low-income housing structure, the California Hotel. So there was a greenhouse back there, there was a little pond, there was beekeeping, um, we had some chickens. So it was just, it was a super, we, the, the gardener, Max, he was brilliant. And he tried to get as much different biodiversity into that small space as he could. And that beautiful little garden was a site of mental health healing. It was a site of education. We threw all of our events there. It was beautiful. And then we also had a partnership with Highland Hospital, which was the public hospital in Oakland. They had a childhood obesity clinic, and we did a partnership with them with our grub box to prescribe our produce box to the families that were dealing with pediatric obesity and then tracking them over time to see how that improved their health outcomes but we didn't just prescribe the box and say go forth and prosper. There were weekly and bi-weekly sessions with the families to see what's going right, what's going wrong, do you have enough recipes, do you need to exchange recipes, are your kids not eating the food? Because we knew that part of justice is community development. You can't just solve a problem and then push it over there. 
Community development takes ongoing maintenance and ongoing relationship building because we're human. We take ongoing maintenance. You gonna go to the gym and just be like, I exercised. Woo, I'm fit. <laughs> Justice work is exactly the same way. But you know, to get to some of my current world, I started feeling like food justice and climate justice and all that type of work that I was doing was missing a piece. And I didn't know what that was. I just felt like there was something I was missing. And then in early 2015, someone invited me to a workshop on soil carbon sequestration. And I said, say what? <laughs> There's a lot of big words. I don't know what that means. But I went to the workshop. And the workshop was talking about how if you build healthy soil, there's not enough carbon in the soil for food that is produced to be nutrient dense, to have enough minerals in it, to really serve and nurture our bodies the way that it needs to. And that climate change is a huge problem, but if you build healthy soil, the carbon that's missing from the soil can go back into the soil because it will be taken out of the air if we're building healthy soil because photosynthesis. I was like, how have I been in climate and food systems and I didn't know the capacity of this? I mean, of course I knew what photosynthesis was, but these numbers they were tossing out, that if we need to be at 350 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere, and we're at a little over 400 right now, we could sequester the 50 parts per million we need if we changed agriculture practices, just in the United States. Whereas I am in DC doing national policy work, talking to drunk climate scientists that are like straight up, I am buying real estate on Mars. <laughs> Cause we are not gonna make it. I have Elon Musk on speed dial like, bro, when you gonna do the rockets? Cause <laughs> shit's going down. That's really how climate scientists at DC felt. The ones that knew the real numbers were like, we can't even publish the stuff that's actually real. And then I learn about soil carbon sequestration and I feel this huge gap. And honestly, the gap is justice work. Agroecology is looking at agriculture from an ecological point of view. Agroecologists have a holistic way of doing work with the environment that is community building, culturally relevant, it's ancestral agriculture practices, it's way beyond biodynamic farming, it's beautiful. Agroecology and agroecologists are drawing carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it back into the soil. They are already doing it. Soil carbon sequestration and soil people right now are repurposing and repackaging something that's always been done by community peasant farmers, really, all over the world. That's good news because there is a ready-made way to invest in soil in a way that can rebuild everything. It's bad news because whenever local people of color have been doing something for a long time and then it's not recognized and then it turns out that someone repackages it and talks about it in another way and then it gets you know, trillions of dollars from the powers that be. That's a difficult dynamic, a little bit. Happens over and over again, so we're working on that. I'm just, I'm working on it, okay, in the soil world. I'm trying to work on it. And I wanna back up a little bit and talk about the connection between food justice and soil because I think emphasizing the point is really important. And I'm gonna wait for the situating to happen just a little bit just a little bit. You in the red sweatshirt, what's your name? Jason. Yes. I'm Jordan. Jordan? Nice to meet you, Jordan. Thank you for being here. We situated a little bit? Awesome. Um, <clears throat> so Jordan, we were just talking about soil <laughs> and why it's so cool. I talked a little bit about nutrient density. And when I talk about nutrient density, what I'm talking about, let's use vitamin A as an example. You would have to eat eight oranges today 
to get the same amount of vitamin A that your grandparents got from eating the same type of orange. Because the soil is so depleted that you need eight times the number of oranges to get the same amount of nutrients. It puts a really different spin on productive land. You can be growing the same amount of something, but the quality of what you're growing goes down completely, even if it's organic. Sometimes. It's a little scary. So one of the reasons why nutrient density connects to food justice is because when I was working in West Oakland, I was consistently talking about getting people more access to fresh fruits and vegetables. People were consistently saying it's really expensive and it's hard. So I was saying go to farmer's markets. What I didn't realize is that farmer's markets were a much bigger, growing food in your own backyard, first of all, is the best answer. Because if you put soil organic matter and compost and all different stuff on your backyard garden, you will have nutrient dense, really nutritious food. That is the best kind of food you can have. Also, if you pull it out of the garden and you don't wash it all the way and you eat the dirt, then you're getting the microbes in the dirt that are really good for your gut. But that might be a step too far for you people. So I'm gonna just <laughs> throw it out there and then reel it back in. Um, and then farmer's markets are the next best thing because if you have farmers that are actually investing in the quality of their healthy soil, and usually they do because if they're doing a farmer's market versus aggregating their produce and selling to a grocery store, they really care about their land. Those two ways are the nutrient dense ways to go. Just buying organic isn't enough if you wanna get really, really nutritious food. I've already talked about climate change, but workforce is another one. Workforce and animals. Building healthy soil, it, there's a bit of a controversy right now about animals or no animals when it comes to whether animals, cows in particular, are good for the environment. Anybody heard of or seen cowspiracy? Yeah. Cowspiracy is on Netflix. So what cowspiracy says is that there is a cow spiracy. <laughs> the beef people want us to eat all the beef and kill the world. We must all be vegan because that is a better way to be, period. I'm gonna add a little bit of complexity to that. A little bit, just a little bit. Agroecology, according to agroecology, animals and plants together is how you create a healthy ecosystem. Animals are not bad, they are just never neutral. There is no way to do cows in a way that will not change the ecosystem dramatically. Either you are building healthy soil the way the plains got built, with a bunch of heavy hooved animals who bunched close together to keep out predators who were pooping a lot and eating a lot and stamping their poop into the ground and then moving on and over a few hundred years that built really, really healthy soil. That was the basis of our agricultural stability in this country. It took 10,000 years to build and 100 years to unmake because soil is fragile. It is the richest, densest, most beautiful thing, and it's incredibly fragile. And when it comes to workforce, folks who work with animals, animals themselves, that to me is a food justice issue. And if we invested in farmers, in ranchers, the way that we were supposed to, we wouldn't have as much of a justice issue, and we would be building healthy soil. So my nerdiness around healthy soil is because at some point I realized that I was working on food justice like this. There was a huge wheel, <clears throat> and I was dealing with the spokes. There's a way that soil has now occurred to me as a hub, because you can work on a bunch of, you can work on water, you can work on food deserts, you can work on a bunch of other things, and be either ignoring or unintentionally degrading other ecological systems because it's hard to see the whole picture. Soil, you cannot fake the funk. If you are degrading any ecological system at all, you will not be building healthy soil. 
You can test it every year and it'll either stay the same or it'll be degrading. But if you focus on building soil, there's actually a beautiful farmer, Joel Salatin, who runs a farm on the East Coast, and he talks about how he grows soil. He says, everybody thinks I'm a farmer. What I really do is I grow soil. And farmers who think like that are the ones that have the best outcomes. So now I feel like soil is a hub. Being fertile as a concept, investing in fertility, is something that has become very, very central and important to me. So how does this show up in real life? My business, Soil and Shadow, we use soil as both the concrete intervention, everything I've been talking about, working with projects that build soil health and soil fertility and advocate for soil in spaces that are only thinking about food or agriculture. But we also use it as a metaphor because I started realizing that soil fertility, the concept of building soil fertility is increasing the complexity of relationships between the minerals and the microbes and the beings that live in soil. <clears throat> Wake up! I just saw a few people nodding off, so I just wanted to <laughs> inject a little bit. Um, soil fertility is about increasing the complexity of relationship between the beings that live in the soil, like microbes, and the nutrients and the minerals in the soil, like carbon. And that is actually one of the best definitions of justice I've ever heard. Increasing the complexity of relationships. It's not having better relationships. It's not having healthy relationships. It's not having strong relationships. It's not having good com relationships. It's complexity. Because I don't know if you've ever been in this situation where the relationships that you're the closest to are the ones that tend to piss you the most, and that you know you love this person, but you just don't like their ass, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> or how your mom is that person that you love almost more than yourself to the point where she says one thing to you, she can either make you feel like you're on top of the world or kill your damn soul. <laughs> that is social fertility in my mind. And it's no different when you're building relationships in the soil. It's Game of Thrones down there. <laughs> Microbes are killing each other all day, every day. It's violent. It's, 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 it's nasty in some ways. It's like a lot of decay and decomposition. And it's life. That's life down there. It's just this rapid fire creation, destruction, creation, destruction, creation, destruction. And the more of that that happens, the more building blocks there are in there. It's beautiful, it's life, it's rich. And if we can create that level of richness socially, we would have beautiful communities that were resilient. That's what I do at Soil and Shadow. I help to draw that connection between how we function as people, using nature as a metaphor, and I try to help ecological systems by helping people understand how people matter and people fit into that picture. So a few examples. I was talking about all of this kind of heady stuff about soil fertility and social fertility, thinking that maybe I was just a weirdo and no one would understand what I meant. I did a podcast and a professor from the University of North Carolina Greensboro called me and said, so I heard your podcast, let me run something by you. We have a building on our campus that was named after um, someone who had a lot of money so there's an elementary school named after him. There's a street named after him. I think he was pretty high up in government. He's very important to the history of that state. He was also one of the architects of white supremacy. So they are renaming the building, the women's building. And they're gonna do a great reopening. And he said, I would love to do a performance art piece the day of the opening. And I'm thinking about it as a horticulture workshop where there will be a farmer, who's an actor, but a farmer doing a workshop on tree pruning, using pruning diseased branches as a metaphor for how you get racism out of a system. <laughs> That's what I thought about when I heard your podcast. Is that what you're talking about? I was like, yes. <laughs> what you said? Yes. So we are working on a performance art script that's gonna be a tree farmer. Well, I call them tree farmers. 
a tree architect talking about tree pruning as a metaphor for getting racism out of a system and healing racism. And it's gonna be a template that any group of students or group of people for that matter can use as a workshop on race and ecology. So that's gonna be available later this year. Thank you. So that's one of the more abstract examples. A more concrete example is that there's one of my intellectual crushes. Her name is Daphne Miller. She wrote a book called Pharmacology, only instead of it being PH, it's F-A-R-M, ecology. And she is a medical doctor who was looking at environmental systems for information about how we could be treating our bodies better. And just so you know what this, just this woman, she has a chapter called Integrated Pest Management as a New Approach to Cancer Care. Check this out. So she was, Integrated Pest Management is where, you know, let's say you have a crop and you know that this particular insect is going to eat this crop, right? It is a pest according to your model. Integrated Pest Management says, nature does not consider that insect a pest. You do. Why don't you make sure that the food chain of the things that that pest eats and the things that eat that pest are well maintained so that that pest stays at the level it's supposed to be in that ecosystem and will thus not overeat your crops? So if you have this bug, make sure that the worms that bug eats are in abundance in your soil, build healthy soil, and make sure that the owls that eat that bug are in abundance in your vineyard or whatever. You don't treat that pest like one thing that needs to be eradicated at the expense of the entire system. Chemotherapy. <laughs> so her chapter was about what if we looked at the very, very, very beginning of cells, cancer cells, when they started metastasizing. And instead of waiting until all we can do is chemotherapy and radiation to keep the system alive, we start developing tests to see when those abnormal cells, which usually are always there, are getting to be a little bit too much in abundance, and then you create the conditions inside your body to manage that. I finished your chapter and threw the book against the wall. No lie. Like, please give this woman millions of dollars. Her name is Daphne Miller. So she is on a quest to make sure that the healthcare system understands soil. She's on a quest to make sure medical doctors get the gut microbiome and the microbes in our gut and how that relates to the soil microbiomes and the microbes in the soil. And we are going to be doing a workshop together in August that's going to bring farmers and folks in ag together with healthcare practitioners and doctors, have them look at each other, talk to each other, understand each other, and get soil. That's another example of a project Soil and Shadow does. So we try to really stay on the razor's edge of what's possible. And what I will end with is my justice work looks like that now because I realized what I was missing. When I thought about justice, I was thinking about people of color, urban. That was my definition of justice. But when I started learning about soil, I realized that rural, white, was also a serious justice issue that I had not ever really put any serious effort toward. And that if I was truly about agriculture and the whole system, I couldn't ignore hundreds of communities in this country that have legacies of farming and ranching and beautiful practices that are being systematically erased, just straight up erased, and manipulated to vote against their own interests. I have to have a story big enough to invite everyone not only to invite everyone to have a seat at the table, to invite everyone to, have, to see their own piece of the story. To say, you are a part of my story, I'm a part of yours. Our destinies are intertwined. That's the work I do now. I use different language. I am a bit of a microbe nerd. 
but it's just as deeper than it's ever been. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Very, very much. So we have a few minutes for questions because the dialogue is always the thing I'm interested in. If you want to make my day, ask me what a fecal matter transplant is. Okay, I saw a hand back there. I think there's a microphone coming to you as well, because this is being recorded. You got Inst Keep talking. You got an Instagram? I do. It's Nikki underscore Silvestri. I bet. Although it's mostly pictures of my baby at this point. <laughs> but he is super cute. What was that? I'm also married. I ain't wearing a ring because I'm too fat to fit into it, but you know, my baby daddy here. <laughs> yeah, I see a question right there. Hi, my name is Lariva. I thought when I read Microbe Hunter by Paul DeCroof when I was in sixth grade that I was a total freak, but you have convinced me that it was just the beginning of something that was going to be really important in my life. Yes. And I appreciate the template of how you talk about healthy growth. Um, mm -hmm. I've always been interested in country music, which I feel is the last bastion of segregated music. You just gave me a template for how to grow that in a healthy way, just based on what you said, so thank you. Thank you. You know, a funny, a funny note about that is she's looking for the next person. There's a song called Boys Around Here by, uh, what's his face? Gwen Stefani's man. Blake Shelton. If you are not into country music, go listen to that song and watch the music video. It'll, it'll convert you. Hi, Nikki. Hi. I work for the Bionutrient Food Association for Dan Kittredge. Yeah! Yeah! And I'm here, and I'll be at the table out there for the next hour and a half if people have questions about your topic. Perfect. So the Bionutrient Food Association, I mean, they're, they're doing the real food campaign and creating a spectrometer, which is a device that's going to be able to read the nutrient density of different fruits and vegetables that you can use. That's how deep they are. Please go talk to her about that. Yes, question right there. Oh, but a question over here, then a question right there. Um, hi, I got here just a little late, and uh, I wasn't sure if you were talking about justice or, or gardens or both, but my nickname is Cactus Pete, often bitter, sometimes sweet. I love it. And up my sleeve, I got more than one trick, and the bad guys I write about call me a prick. But what I, I do, living cactus fences because they're firewalls, erosion controls, food source, flower source, fruits, the most underrated food source on land. And I have that information with me. I also want to let you know that I'm a, the second witness in the Mumia Abu Jamal uh, situation. I witnessed the murder of the officer in 1981, and mm. I'm finding it very difficult to get people to uh, look at this information. I found out some interesting things about the lawyers involved. And the, my last question is, and maybe you can address this, is that most of these uh, students today, they know the name of um, uh, the, the man, Mandela, but very few of them know the name of Leonard Peltier, Mumia Abu Jamal, and Dr. Jeffrey McDonald, who are our heroes, and that I also make a mention very often because I believe that I'm like a crazy Obi-Wan Kenobi and you're the potential Jedi Knights. You're the most powerful people in the most powerful state on the planet. And something that they used to do before 1970s, which is called a boycott and a strike, actually worked every time. So I real quick, was the question about bridging the generations? Uh, well, I wanted you to a a a a address the fact that why is it that they know Mandela but not the other three names? And I found out recently in Russia, 15 well, let me students wrote a, a, a petition for, for uh, um, um, Peltier. So let me answer that question real quick. 
Um, I am speaking as a very old millennial, so I am not trying to talk for y'all. But I think what that question brings up for me is who are our heroes? Who are your heroes? Who are my heroes? Are you speaking intergenerationally with your folks, either your family or your friends or your larger community, about the heroes that cross generations? Are you up to date on the justice issues that don't just affect you, but that affect others and other generations? Those are all incredibly important questions to ask as you start and continue your journey as activists. So there was a question here, over there as well. So what is uh, fecal transmission anyway? What is what? Fecal transmission, or what, 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 what was it? Ah, fecal matter transplants. <laughs> yes, my favorite subject. So there are many doctors who believe that gut health is the source of all disease, right? You can tell by your microbiome in your gut, which is the composition of microbes and bacteria in your gut, and also the level of inflammation in your gut what's going on with a lot of your other systems. So there are doctors who were saying, if you eat food, you can absolutely change your gut microbiome pretty quickly, but it's a lot quicker to just put the microbes that are supposed to be in there in there. And there's a lot of microbes that you cannot get after you're about two. Like the infant's gut microbiome, once it forms, it's pretty stuck. So where do most of our gut microbes live? Poop. So, how do you get microbes from one person's gut to another person's gut? You transfer poop. You take poop from one person, you use an enema, and you put that poop into another person. Now, I know that you're like, why would anyone ever do this, right? I'm sure that's what you're thinking. They would do it because the impact and the results they're getting, either you can take a bunch of super toxic medication that has a bunch of side effects that's only gonna 50% help you over the course of three years, or you get a fecal matter transplant and in a few days have 100% results. No lie. That's what some of the early trials of fecal matter transplants are showing because your gut health is so central to all of your other systems. So look it up. It's some pretty revolutionary stuff. I think the early stuff they're doing is with obesity because a lot, of the, a lot of the reason why certain body types stay that way over time is because of the gut microbiome. So if people who's, whose bones are struggling because of the amount of weight they're carrying are finding really good impacts from this. Google fecal matter transplants, good stuff. <laughs> Can I go? Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I got a quick question. Um, two questions. One is, have you heard of Dr. Greger, uh, How Not to Die? Have you read it? His book? How I... How Not to Die. I've heard of How Not to Die. I didn't know who read it or who wrote it. Yeah, Dr. Greger. He does a lot okay. of research and like um, all that stuff, like the, the gut microbiome. Yeah. One of the stuff he does is like beans increases the gut microbiome or asparagus, eating asparagus. Uh-huh. So, uh, and my other question is... What are you putting in your soil to increase the nutrient dense? Yeah, how does all that work? Yeah. No, no, what do you put in it? What do you put in I mean, soil organic matter usually is the quickest way, compost. Or yeah. you can graze animals. But you if put, any... Yeah. Are you putting rock dust? Because they say rock dust has about 70 to 90... Oh, rock dust. Yeah. Um, I don't have a particular piece of soil that I work with, but the main ranch that I work with in Piscinas they use animal grazing mostly. So they have a bunch of cattle and they graze it in a way that builds healthy soil. So it's the cow manure mostly. Mm. And it's kind of plains land. But if anybody, this, this is a very important question because if you have a backyard garden and you're actually looking to increase the soil organic matter and nutrient density of what you're growing, the Marin Carbon Project and the Carbon Cycle Institute have done a bunch of different studies on 35 different techniques to build carbon in soil and build healthy soil. And it's all the way from big picture stuff for farms to small picture stuff for gardeners with the specific things like oyster shells, rock dust, things like that. Can you repeat the, those two uh, companies? The Marin Carbon Project and the Carbon Cycle Institute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
I just want to say I'm a farmer at uh, Shona Farms for Sustainable Agriculture. And I appreciate you the gap of the soil. Because I feel like a lot of people don't know that's where it really starts. Can you use the microphone? I don't. Oh, sorry. That works. Yeah. Um, I just want to say I appreciate you bridging the gap of knowledge for soil because a lot of people don't know that's where it first starts. And um, making that metaphor to connect people, it's just amazing. I wanted to ask if you have any work, of, um, like a book or anything that we can read or? I have a blog. That works. <laughs> <laughs> I will have a book at some point. Just not soon, probably. I'm trying to get my baby to be one before I think about that kind of stuff. But if you go to NikkiSilvestri.com and you click on blog, or if you follow me on social media, I share a ton of resources between my writing and podcasts and things like that. And that's where I usually spread the, the good word. OK, it is 12 o'clock. So thank you very much.